Getting into home labbing and setting up your first home server can be an intimidating process. It's not nearly as simple as buying a regular desktop where you can just walk into your local Best Buy and walk out with a ready to go system in about five minutes. A home server is often more dependent on your specific use cases. Are you running a game server? Is it gonna be an ass? Are you looking for a low power file hosting system? Are you just trying to impress the ladies or maybe all the above? Well, depending on where and who you ask, you can get varying responses to what hardware and software you should be going with. And the truth is, for better or for worse, that oftentimes there are plenty of options to get you where you need to go. So today, we're gonna to be talking about how to approach setting up home servers for beginners. Okay, let me clarify a few things first. This is for beginners. This is for the people who find the home server space intimidating and might be afraid to get started as they don't want to mess up. Let me start by saying I was in this boat a few years ago, so don't worry. I thought that when I started, I needed special hardware to run a real home server. Let me know down in the comments some of the misconceptions you had when you first got into building your home server and or home lab. I'd be interested to hear your stories. Another thing I want to acknowledge is that there will be no home server gatekeeping here. A home server is simply a computer that serves a purpose for your needs or wants. This can be a tiny little Raspberry Pi or a massive 64 core epic monstrosity that your girl swears is just a friend. The people who will look down on you for running a Raspberry Pi or an old desktop as your home server are losers who probably poured their milk before their cereal anyway. All right, let's get started with the first step, and that is to decide what is it you want this server to do. Don't worry if you don't have a clear idea or any specific use cases. Sometimes learning is both the journey and the destination, and that's perfectly okay. For those of you who do have specific ideas like a NAS, media server, web hosting, or DNS server, that'll make it easier to pick out hardware that aligns with those needs. So let's talk about hardware because that's often a hot topic when it comes to home servers. Now, like I said before, pretty much any computer can be a home server, assuming the software you wanna run is supported on the hardware you decide to choose. What do I mean by that? Well, at the highest level, there are two major paths you can choose from when it comes to hardware, ARM and x86. x86 is the platform you're probably most familiar with, which includes your Intel and AMD platforms, and can run like 99% of the home lab software out there, so pretty common. ARM is gonna be your power efficient, cost effective platforms, mainly used in mobile devices, but has since branched out into more consumer and desktop products, most notably the Raspberry Pi, and as of a few years ago, the Apple's M1 chips. ARM, while gaining popularity and can still support a massive collection of software, can sometimes lead to some compatibility issues for some services. So why even go with ARM? Well, like I said before, for the most part, it's cheaper and uses less power, which often leads to a smaller footprint, less noise, and less heat. Remember, if you don't need a massive NAS encoding server or plan to run heavy CPU tasks, then you don't need more expensive higher-end hardware. Those of you that wanna go the x86 route, let's talk about what hardware you should be looking for. Now again, keep in mind your use cases for your server when choosing the parts. For the most part, any Intel or AMD CPU can be used at the heart of your system. However, there are a couple of things to consider when choosing your CPU. The first things you wanna make note of are the thread count, clock speed, and age of the platform. The more cores or threads you have, the better your CPU will be at running multiple services at a time. For someone just getting into home labs, I'd say four cores and eight threads is a good starting point, but you can certainly go for more or less. The clock speed will determine how quickly your CPU can run each of these tasks, though the clock speed isn't everything. The overall speed of a CPU is going to be determined by a combination of its clock speed, as well as its IPCs or instructions per cycle. This often isn't advertised, which is why I mentioned to look at the age of the platform as for the most part, IPCs tend to go up as newer platforms are released. This is the reason why a four gigahertz CPU from like 10 years ago will absolutely get shit stomped by a modern CPU running at nearly half the clock speed. 
Another reason why you'll want to look at the age of the platform is to determine memory specification, PCI compatibility, I.O., and especially how readily available parts will be. I mean, sure, you can find a really old, cheap Xeon CPU with four cores, but you may have trouble finding a motherboard to go with it. You'll be stuck using older RAM, and you'll be without some of the modern creature comforts like USB 3.0, NVMe support, and in some cases, limited PCIe slots. Now again, if you don't need any of those things and just want a cheaper system, then by all means, go for it. In the end, the only things that are truly important for choosing a CPU is to make sure it supports virtualization and unless you have a dedicated graphics card that it has built-in graphics. More on that in a bit. So whether that be an Intel Core i3, Xeons, AMD, Ryzen's, Phenoms, or Epics, you can find out most of the time by just Googling the CPU model and looking for virtualization support and internal graphics. Luckily, most of the CPUs that came out within the last seven or eight years will support virtualization, so you should be good to go. The other pieces of hardware, graphics, RAM, hard drives, will be more dependent on what you plan to do with your server, as well as your budget. So for graphics, it's often safe to assume that you need at least some kind of GPU, whether that's a dedicated graphics card built into the CPU, or in some cases, a small GPU built into the motherboard. But this is usually only the case for higher end server hardware. You may think that you don't need any graphics if you're just gonna run the system headless and it's just sitting in your closet, but a lot of systems won't even post if there's no kind of GPU detected. For RAM, again, it's more about what your platform supports and what you plan on running. For beginner, I'd say you can get by with about eight gigabytes, but the more the better. Now, an important thing about RAM is to make sure that you are getting the correct RAM for your system. If you go with a server model CPU like Xeon or Epic, then you'll be able to use ECC or error correction code RAM versus regular consumer RAM. ECC is a huge benefit for systems that are running 24 seven as the RAM is constantly being written to and read from. So naturally there's gonna be some times where there's an error. In a regular system, this is where you'd see a blue screen or a crash, but with ECC RAM, it can often mitigate the error and continue to work. This is why I push going with a system that supports ECC RAM. However, if you already have the consumer hardware laying around and you just wanna turn it into a server, I certainly wouldn't fault you for going that route. For hard drives, this is probably the most dependent on your use case and will vary widely from person to person. If you're looking to set up a NAS that hosts a ton of videos, photos, games, recipes, world domination plans, then you'll probably want a lot of hard drives. Keep in mind that if you go with an older platform, you may be limited on how many SATA or SAS ports you have, and you may have to purchase a dedicated HBA card to increase the number of drives your system can support. For the most part, I'd recommend snagging two or three one terabyte hard drives so that you can get a decent amount of storage space and have a few drives to play around with with different RAID configurations. A good place to start would be with my budget home server video in which I show you that you can get a solid setup all for under $500. Now I could go on and on about all the varying differences and nuances about choosing certain hardware over another, but unless you want this video to be a full feature length film, then we'll have to move on because there's a lot more stuff to cover. Software. So you've got your hardware picked out and you're ready to actually run something on it. But when you look up home server operating systems, you're met with dozens of different options and everyone on the forums claims that X is better than Y and that if you use Y, you're basically an incel, but Z is okay as long as you're not running it with Q. Let me simplify this for a second. In general, it does not matter which operating system you eventually go with. For the most part, every operating system can get you where you need to go for a majority of home server services, whether you want to run Windows 10, Arch Linux, FreeBSD, Mac OS, or any dedicated hypervisor OS. Now, I've already done a video about setting up a home server on a Windows 10 machine versus a basic hypervisor, so I'll link that up here and down below. It's a solid video to help you get started, and I definitely recommend checking it out. But let me give you the TLDR here. You can throw Windows or a desktop version of Linux onto your server and go with Docker to run all your services and be perfectly fine. You can also install something like VirtualBox to spin up virtual machines from within Windows. So why even go with something else? That sounds pretty great, right? Well, desktop systems are designed to be just that, desktop operating systems. Yes, they can meet your home lab needs, but 
If you want much more flexibility with your hardware and want to run it with much less overhead, then you want to go with a dedicated hypervisor operating system. This is an operating system that runs on your server without a desktop environment, but in most cases, offers you a dedicated web GUI that is much more suited to a home lab environment, including dedicated commands and sections to create VMs, services, allocate CPU cores, memory, storage, and even pass through hardware directly to one of those VMs. Now, there are plenty of solid hypervisor operating systems out there, but I'm gonna to briefly touch on the four that I'm most familiar with. Proxmox, Unraid, TrueNAS Scale, and TrueNAS Core. Yes, there are others out there that are great, and I'm a total noob for not being an expert in all of them, and blah, 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 blah. So three of these are Linux-based, which means you get access to the best way of running services with Docker. Now, Docker deserves multiple videos dedicated to it, but for this case, just know that Docker is a widely supported platform with plenty of support that runs on Linux and allows you to spin up services with little to no overhead. TrueNAS Core is FreeBSD based, so they use jails as a way to containerize and spin up services, which in a vacuum isn't bad, but when Docker exists, it's kind of hard to justify going that route. So I even mentioned TrueNAS Core. Well, personally, I think it's the best system if you're going to go with a dedicated NAS. I run TrueNAS Core in my system, and it's honestly the most stable thing in my entire home lab. But wait, I just talked about how Linux and Docker are so great. Why wouldn't I run one of the others? Well, I am. I run Proxmox as my main hypervisor OS, and I've actually created a VM in there to run TrueNAS Core. It's running a hypervisor within a hypervisor, kind of like that famous movie, um, Shrek 2. Now this is a bit more advanced and I certainly wouldn't recommend doing this for beginners, which is why I'd recommend choosing a single hypervisor and getting familiar with that first. Now, which one should you go with? Well, that's a tough question and honestly, there's no right or wrong answer. Proxmox isn't the most user-friendly, but its virtualization features are top-notch. Unraid has an extremely inviting GUI and lively community, but it isn't free. TrueNAS Scale is extremely new, but has amazing NAS functionality built right in. So do some research, ask around, flip a coin, throw a dart, whatever. If you made me choose one to recommend for a beginner knowing nothing about what they were gonna use it for, then I'd probably recommend to go with Unraid due to it being more user-friendly. Now, like I said before, these hypervisors don't have desktop environments like your traditional operating systems. You'll install these on a USB drive that you flash the ISO file onto, and then once they're installed, you'll be able to access them directly using the CLI or over your network using any browser, which is pretty neat. So there you go, you've got your hardware picked out, you've got your operating system of choice up and running, you've got all the chicks all over you at this point, now what? Well, you probably wanna run some actual services. Most hypervisors come with some kind of way to host services or apps with just a few clicks. In Proxmox, you have the LXC containerization, and in Unraid or TrueNAS, you have their apps that are running on top of Docker. Now, you aren't forced to use this if you don't want. With TrueNAS and Unraid, I'd recommend to use theirs because they're built on top of Docker. But with Proxmox, I'd go with a dedicated Linux VM or container that runs Docker itself. So why do I keep mentioning Docker? Well, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that Docker is easy to pick up for beginners because it's not. It does, however, have a large community and plenty of support. And as you can see in some hypervisors, it has an entire GUI built on top of it to make it easy to run services without even having to know much about Docker at all. You can choose to go this route and learn a bit along the way or spin up your own VM and dive headfirst into Docker and use the CLI. Either way, Docker will give you a consistent platform for deploying services no matter which Linux-based hypervisor you eventually go with. Oh. And it also runs on macOS and Windows. Neat. And remember how we talked about compatibility on ARM versus x86? Well, when you go to download a Docker image for a particular software, you can easily check the tags to see if it does in fact support ARM systems. Now, if you don't want to use Docker at all, then that's perfectly fine too. You can spin up entire VMs with whatever OS you want and run your apps there. Note that this does provide unnecessary overhead, but if you're more comfortable with that route, then go for it. At this point, you're pretty much set up and ready to go. Just a few more things before we wrap up. With all these cool services running, you're probably thinking about how to access them from outside your home network. I have a few videos on how to get this set up and I'll link them down below, but 
Just know that it is never a good idea to expose your hypervisor or firewall directly to the outside world. I know it's tempting to be able to access your hypervisor GUI using your domain from anywhere in the world, but be careful as if this gets compromised, then your entire system is exposed. The correct way would be to set up a VPN connection to your home network and access your server that way. Another thing, as cliche as it is, is to have fun with it. Don't be afraid to try new things and mess up, assuming you're not working with important data that has no backup. You're gonna run into things that don't work the way you want them to. You will fail. It happens to literally everyone and that's okay. If you get stuck, then reach out for help. Feel free to join the Radial Discord where we have lots of nerds willing to help out no matter how much of a beginner you are. And I promise, nobody will make you feel inferior for just trying to learn. And if they do, I'll banish them to the shadow realm. All right, it is time for comment of the week. Where is my phone? Oh my God, it is, I, I did this last video. I looked for my phone and I'm using it as the freaking teleprompter. All right, this comment comes from Daniel C on my TrueNAS Scale uh, intro video. And he says, hi, will you make the change from Proxmox to TrueNAS Scale? I already set up Proxmox, but I think I like TrueNAS Scale more for uh, how they manage storage. So for your use, what are your pros and cons? And what would it take you to make the switch? So as of right now, I will still be using Proxmox as my main production hypervisor OS, but I am thinking about changing my backup server from Proxmox to TrueNAS Scale. I just like the virtualization features built into Proxmox a lot more than in TrueNAS Scale. I will admit that TrueNAS Scale has a much better NAS functionality built on top of it, but for my use case, for my personal production machine, I'm sticking with Proxmox. But if you would ask me for a beginner or for somebody setting up a NAS, which one to go with, I would probably suggest TrueNAS Scale. So that is it for this video. I know there are a lot of things out there that I didn't cover, but this was meant to be a high level video for beginners. If you liked the video and you thought it was entertaining or you're just a super cool dude, then drop a like. And if you really just like the sound of my voice, then hit that subscribe button. I'd like to give a shout out to my Patreons and YouTube members, the absolute chads of the Raid Owl community that help support everything I do. You guys are dope, but that is all. If you got this far in the video, I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.